Public diplomacy is important in foreign policy and strategic communication for emerging powers like India. With expanding economies and worldwide ambitions, rising nations are engaging in purposeful communication with audiences all over the world in order to build goodwill and positive opinions. In these endeavors, social media has been substantially and widely employed. India is a perfect example of a rising power promoting communication through social media. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Suresh Kochatel to the stage. Suresh Kuchatil is a social media activist who revels in challenging the system or the lack of it. He is on the advisory panel of the BJP IT team in Telangana. A hotel management professional who worked with the Taj group of hotels, he moved into media with a 16-year-long stint with Times of India. He spent the last decade with Apollo Hospitals Foundation. Along the way, Mr. Suresh Kochatil used his vast experience and mentored over a dozen startups, mainly in the healthcare IT space. He also worked with Lebua Hotels and Resorts as Vice President, PR and Digital Media before returning to India and joining Janam TV as its Chief Operating Officer in 2020. He was also a part of the social media team of BJP in 2014 Lok Sabha elections and worked extensively in Varanasi, the Prime Minister's constituency. Mr. Kochadil, a social media influencer, has a dedicated fan following on Facebook and Twitter which he leverages to influence opinion and corrective action across the political landscape. A TEDx speaker, Mr. Suresh is a much sought after public speaker and also teaches branding and marketing in leading management colleges from the last 18 years. I invite Mr. Suresh Kochadil to address the gathering. Okay, thank you. Glad to be speaking here and uh, one of the disadvantages of speaking last is that uh, you are stuck between people who want to leave and uh, you know and uh, I want to and those who want to leave or catch a flight is especially the speakers and I know there is there are some students and professors from Amritapuri Kollam here and I was just looking at the distance from here to there by time it's three hours and nine minutes showing as of now so I want you to reach the hostel before they close the mess so that you can have your dinner so I won't take much time I will stick to the allotted 35 to 40 minutes that I have, 30 minutes, and we will take some Q&A after that. We heard all the speakers uh, from morning today, and Anastup and uh, Rajamani sir last, and actually I, had a, I was telling Rajamani sir and Anastup that, you know, it, the, if you take up all the things like he spoke about uh, the football thing that happened on stage at St. Stephen's, I'll also kind of have nothing to speak at the end of it because everybody speaks about the same subject which I'm supposed to speak. But my field being media, I spent almost all my life in the media field, even now. Uh, as I speak, one of my videos just got released in one of the channels in Hyderabad. But today, why are we speaking about media so much? Why is that people like the Prime Minister, the opposition leaders, political personalities, sports personalities, everybody tries to influence the media to create an impression? And this is the main thing that we need to realize. How is it that it is used from an international state? How do you use media as a soft power? We all know we've been speaking about hard power software right from the morning today. Professor Nays, Harvard uh, School's uh, thought process and the entire thing. But what is it that about the soft power that has changed in the last eight years or nine years? True, we did. We got our independence 75 years ago, but we never ever leveraged India as a place which we can leverage things. So what you're speaking about right now is the best propaganda is not propaganda. And we know that from the time of Stalin and Lenin and Mao and everybody, that how do you use your propaganda is not to create a propaganda. It should be done in such a subtle way that an international audience or anybody whom you want to listen to feels that he needs to go there. And as I say, a diplomat is a such a wonderful person that he can tell you to go to hell and you'd really feel like going there. That is what the diplomatic language is all about. We are all in the information age today. Every one of us, all the MBA students sitting there, and I've been teaching MBA students for the last 19 years now in Hyderabad and many other cities. And one of the things I tell them is an old dialogue from a Malayalam movie. I don't remember which movie is that. In that the dialogue, one of the dialogues asked to that student is, when he's brushing his teeth in the morning, is near Indira Padikine. So the guy blurts out uh, some BCom or something. He says, no, 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 I So there are two ways you can twist that statement. So typically in an information age, if you don't keep up and if you don't learn what you're supposed to learn, then I'm sh sorry to say that it's a dog-eats-dog -dog world there once you leave this campus. 
or the MBA campus wherever you are studying. So information age, credibility is the scarcest resource. That is the most, if you ask any international, today Ukraine-Russia war is going on. I didn't want to bring that subject here, but entire stories in the media is anti-Russia, if you observed. All the media, across the board, every other media is carrying the Russian news and the Russian news channels and Russian social media channels have all been blacklisted. It looks on ground that Ukraine is winning the war, but our six months down the line, neither Russia is winning nor Ukraine is winning. But we will come down to the present one. What happens when countries want to get what they want? So if you use a hard power, if you go and rain a dozen missiles into the Ukrainian power network, you get what you want. But the other ways of doing it, and that is to co-opt the entire thing, or soft power, that is what many nations are trying to do now. And we being the land of the Mahatmas, the saints, we are very good at convincing people, saying, do what you want us to do. And that is the main thing there. Contrast with hard power, I just give you a few examples. There are a lot more of that in the Cold War era. It was spoken of, Anusup, I think, spoke about that earlier, about how exactly that Cold War, when the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War was one reason why hard power only worked in that era. But we are a nation which uses our soft power for many other things. And right, not now, it happened right from the BC days to the present time. And Joseph Ney, the Harvard University, all of us have been quoting him from morning here today. His two books on soft power should be read. I think they should be in your library soon. If not, they are not there because it's very essential to understand in today's world, hard power is only about 30%, 70% works through soft power, which is why United Nations is still serving. It's a debating society, nothing beyond that. Nothing happens in UN. They pass 101 resolutions. All the heads of state go and speak there. By the end of the day, if you ask them, what did you do? Nothing. And Shashi Tharoor is a classic example of that. A country may obtain its outcomes. And soft power and media, this is where I'm bringing the media. A country may obtain the outcomes it wants in the world of politics for three reasons. Admire its values. Now, if you ask audience here, if I ask you, which is the country which you would all admire Leave out India now. Let's leave India. Let's say for any reason, which is the one of the countries you would admire? Can I have something from the audience? One country you say, I admire this country. No? No country? You don't admire any country? If you ask me, I admire Israel. For very obvious reasons. They are a small country boxed in from all sides with hostile nations who keep firing missiles into the country every day. But it is also the most technologically advanced nation in the world. It has got the best startups. Morning, uh, Anusubji was speaking about uh, how the nations file patents. The largest number of patents that you will see, actual active patents, are from Israel. They have rain-fed regions where they don't get rain at all, but they produce some of the best agriculture processes. So much so that Chandra Babu and I do got them to Kupam to do a project there. This is what it is all about. It's to admire the values of that nation and say, I want to be like that nation. So that's one example. Anyway, you all have a choice to and emulate by example. We, we did Balakot. When we did Balakot, why did we do Balakot? We could have kept quiet, isn't it? A Pulwama happened, Uri happened, everything happened. We did a raid across the border. We went there, we did all that stuff. We did that in Manipur. We did that across the Pakistani border. But the question is, how do you emulate by example? So hitting hard, that again is a hard power. But remember, the ability, the people kept talking for Balakot for ages after that. And after that, Pakistan has not tried anything of that sort again. It sends a message that you hit me, I'll hit you back. But that's hard power. But the soft power is the message. How that message goes to that audience. And that's extremely important. Aspires level and prosperity and openness. To a large extent, democratic countries are like that. If you look at Iran today, what's happening there in the hijab issue where people are getting hanged just because they protested. And then you have a country like India where you can do anything you want and still the Supreme Court says every sinner has a future. So they let a rapist go, they let a murderer go saying, no, no, everybody has a future. Okay, it's a debatable thing, but some countries aspire. I want to be like this country because of its openness. Now, we talked to Finland in the afternoon, the first session where Anustop did that. Finland education system, fine, Sweden. Sometimes it's all about healthcare, and we say Kerala has the best healthcare system in India, which is equal to that of the European countries. How would you aspire for that? That's a question of the soft power. So you want another nation to admire you, so they admire our IT, our engineering power. Most of the nations, if you go to any foreign country, 
and speak about India, the first thing they talk about your engineers, your ability to do mathematics calculation without a calculator. The Indian students are very that's why we win spelling bee in US like crazy. We win so many spelling bee contests because our ability to memorize and reproduce is extremely good, but it has its own negatives. So how does soft power in international politics work? Because I'm a media guy, this is all I speak all day. I do uh, my stories every day only on this subject, uh, politics, politics, and politics. So uh, pardon me if I'm repeating myself. Rajamani sir did sports, so here is a diversion for you, a slight diversion. So as I told you before, it's ability to co-opt and coerce. Today you can threaten a nation. You can threaten Iran with sanction. You can threaten North Korea with sanction. Did it all work? Yes or no? Did it work? North Korea still fires missiles like Diwali rockets every now and then, you know. Because he finds it very funny. He finds it good to use his missile to see whether it really work or they go and fall in Japan or into the sea. That's what he does. But he's still there despite coercing him. But how about convincing him? Nobody has tried it, but it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work. It involves shaping the preferences of others through appeal and attraction. So if you go to the US and you say, US makes the best movies in the world. We make the largest, but they make the best movies in the world. Okay, so is it an aspiration that we're looking for? Or UK for that matter with Oxford and Cambridge and you say, I want to be like them. I want this, my educational institution to be another Oxford, another Cambridge. Okay, or even Cornell in the US. I want to be like them. That's an aspiration that you're trying to define and saying, I want to be like them. It's an appeal or an attraction. And you shape their preferences. By people sitting in the room, Anusu asked today, during the presentation, a lot of questions, interesting questions came up. And one of them was this. What is it that you look for in a country? Why do you want to go to that country? Why Vietnam? Why not Finland? That's a question that is there. So all these preferences today that we are, you are kind of doing is to define the feature of soft power. And how do we in, in India use that? So I'll bring that up in the later part of the presentation as to how India is using that. Because I'm a communications person and that's what I do day in and day out. So how do we softly, without you realizing that you're getting hit, somebody hits you. That is the way, that's a great ability to do it. And you accept that it is good that you get hit. Okay. So defining the feature of soft power, it is non-coercive. So nobody forces you anything. Nobody told you anything. There are many ways of doing it. I think our parents are the greatest examples of that. You know, they tell you in such a soft way that you go wash your plate, that you really feel like going and washing your plate after dinner. It's put in a very, very subtle way. The message, one look from your mom, that's enough for you to understand that it has to be done. Okay. The currency of soft power includes culture. We are very, very rich in culture. And I'll show you some examples of that. Political values. What do you stand up for? Why did India get a G20 presidency? Why not some other country? There are 20 countries in that, including United States. Why didn't they get it? There's a reason for it. There's a reason why we do that. And foreign policies. I think if you ask me, one of the best performing ministers in the present Narendra Modi government is Dr. Jay Shankar. If you see his press conferences, if you see his media interactions, if you see the way he travels around the world, he has created possibly the best impression after Sushma Swaraji did. God bless her soul. She did it. And he has done even something better because he was a career diplomat. So he knows how to deal with these fellows very well. He knows how to deal with China. He knows how to deal with Iran. He knows how to deal with Russian oil problem. All this. Okay, so I'll play a short video of uh, Dr. Jay Shankar. Volume, please. Condemning One. Russia. With India counting on a global support for, uh, in its struggle with China, its issues with China. Um, how do you think you'll be trusted by others after that? Why do you think anyone will help Delhi after you didn't help others over Ukraine? Thank you. If I were to take Europe collectively, which has been singularly silent on many things which were happening, for example, in Asia, you could ask why would anybody in Asia trust Europe on anything at all? We have a difficult relationship with China. We're perfectly capable of managing it. A lot of our problems in China have nothing to do with Ukraine, have nothing to do with Russia. They predate it. You know, somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That it's, if it is you, it's yours. If it is me, it's ours. I think I, I am a, I'm one fifth of the world's population. I am what today the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. 
uh, I, I mean, forget the history civilization bit. Everybody knows that. But I, I think I'm entitled to have my own side. I'm entitled to weigh my own interests, make my own choices. Make my own choices. I'm entitled. Look at the answer. He hit that guy who asked that question. He must be regretting why he said it. But he said it in such a subtle way that Europe thinks its problems are the world problems. No, we know how to deal with China. We will deal with them. We will know how to deal with the Ukraine problem. We bought the Russian oil. They created a huge hangama. We, but we, way we convinced the entire world, including United States and the European Commission, that look, NATO, everybody, that look, it's perfect for us to buy oil at $60 a barrel when it's ruling at 110 now. That is the way it is done. So let's look at, he spoke about certain things. Dr. Jayashankar also mentioned about culture. He said we are the richest culture. And I, I don't want to talk about it. He said, but here I'm going to talk about it. When Modi ji went to Kedarnath for the first time, not the first time, he went a lot of times before, but when he went out to unveil the statue of uh, St. Adi Shankaracharya there, he meditated in a cave. Many of you would remember that picture. That cave booking, actually it's a commercial booking, was sold out for the next two years after that. Now imagine, and a lot of this booking came from abroad. What for to go and meditate in that cave? Not because Modi ji went there, but because of that. Nobody knew that place. It was existing before. It just got a refurbishment. Imagine the soft power we created with that message, the subtle message. They say an image speaks, a, a photo, a photograph or an image speaks a thousand words. Just put a picture of something and it will say what it says. And that is what happened with that. Then came the Kashi Vishwanath Dham, the renovation of the entire project. I, as I was mentioned in my brief talk before that I was introduced that I spent almost a month and a half in Varanasi in 2014 uh, working with the social media team there on ground and one thing that Modi ji made clear very clear when he came to speak in the election rallies there he said he told the citizens of Varanasi if you eat pan and spit on the streets nothing is going to improve stop that habit and I will improve this city and that's what he did so Kashi Vishwanath Dham again 100 crores of revenue must have read the newspapers just last week 100 crores of revenues it generated in the last few months a place where people just used to go visit the guards Kashi Vishwanath Dham, temple, and then come back. It is, some people didn't like the renovation. So, so let's live with it. Can't help it. That is how renovations are done. They say, oh, it's lost its originality. So what? So if something is not working, renovate it, but retain most of it. So that's what happened. So we have created a cultural icon to attract a soft power, to people to come to India. As it is, people come to India. But here you have created a new spot, not just for Indians, but those from abroad. Then the Ujjain Mahakal project. And doesn't stop with all this. Remember the last two, which I, I just mentioned, Kashi Vishwanath Dham and Ujjal Mahakal are part of the Jyotirlingas. So there are 12, 10 others still left. Elora is there, a lot of other places. Sri Shailam is there, Andhra Pradesh. That is what the entire thing is all about. Convincing people, convincing an international audience, look at my culture. Now I'll tell you, there is a place called Irinyalakoda here in, in uh, Kerala. How many are from there? It's six kilometers from my village of Karun. How many of you know about this place called Irinyalakoda? Yes, it's got what got the biggest temple, the Kudal Manikin Kshetram, which at one time was the temple with the largest land holdings in India, 75,000 hectares of land. Anyway, that's a separate story. All that land is gone. Nothing is left with the temple now. But that was the place where the great mathematician Madhavacharya did all his theory about mathematics. Now, how many of us in this room know about that? We all know about European mathematicians the Pythagoras theorem and all that jazz, but we don't speak about this particular one, isn't it? Now, imagine if the Kerala government had taken that up and said, okay, here is the home. We don't know where it is right now. It's supposed to be six kilometers from the center of Irinyalakoda, where that, uh, the great mathematician lived and practiced, but there's nothing about him. And I'll bring you one more, a couple of examples of that, especially from Kerala, to ask you whether you knew this place or not. Let's look at the political values. Clean image. Now, this is where the tourism matters. A taxi driver at the airport cheating an international passenger will send a message down the line to everybody that India is the best place to be avoided. Isn't it? Or a tourist getting molested or raped or whatever it is, it creates that bad image. So what does the government have to do? It has to provide the secure environment for people to travel. It sends a message out that this is a place that thrives on democratic values. It is diverse. It is a very safe place to come. We are, sorry, we are a country that's so diverse that we have hundreds of languages, we have hundreds of dialects, but 
we are existing as a nation. Tell me which other nation has a desert on one hand and snow-capped uh, peaks on the other hand, backwaters on one hand, and then of a rainy rainforest on the other side. We don't have it. No other country has it. We have it, but we have not marketed it that way. We have not given the soft power that it deserves to go that way. Sorry, I'll come back to the last one, the foreign policies. And I just spoke about that, how the Russian oil, it blew up on India's face. All countries, especially the European bloc, wanted to ban India. But Dr. Jayashankar made it very, very clear, look, we are our own boss, we take our own decisions. It is a soft power that is subtly given to them, saying, don't get into my territory, I know what to do. I know what is best for my country and I will do that. And I, I know what is good for my citizens. Soft power entails gentle people to get off. Look, we know our business. Don't interfere with us. We are a different country before 2014 and now. In today's world of politics, particularly in international politics, this particular thing which we are speaking about now, soft power, is a necessity. Many countries have got tired of fighting. Even so-called Kim Jong-un in North Korea has got so bored of it now, firing missiles, that nobody is observing that he's firing missiles. But China keeps prodding India on one hand, Taiwan on the other hand. They keep doing this business. That is their business. So today, China has also realized that, look, Galwan or Tawang, it is essential that we keep talking. That is the most important thing. And it, today, this entire thing has become a necessity because countries don't have money. Pakistan is a classic case in point. It is going around with a begging bowl in its hand and it knows that it cannot even blast a nuclear missile. Forget it. It doesn't even have the money to buy a button to press the nuclear missile. So you know your limitations and you work with those limitations. That is the most important thing. Compare this with the old way of getting things done by threatening people. The Cold War era. I will fire a missile into India. Remember Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's famous statement, we will eat grass but we will still produce a nuclear weapon. Now they are eating grass. That's the difference. New York Times, Washington Post, for all, the f all of you who are on Twitter especially, Economist, Wall Street Journal, everybody are hostile to India and will be hostile to India. At least till Narendra Modi ji goes out of office. This is a but natural thing. Today, media in India, I'm sorry, I'm a part of it. Rajamani sir was also a part of it, still a part of it. Today, it is a sold out weapon. Advertising works, money is needed to run the establishment. So if you are taking a full page in Wall Street Journal, whoever gives it, they will give a write-up for that. That is a part of the deal. You get good priority. So don't wait for, don't let international publications determine your country's stability or country's views. To hell with them. That's what we are doing now. Doesn't matter. Go speak what you want on Wall Street Journal or New York Times or Washington Post. We care a damn. We want our thing to be done. Why is it that so much hostility is there? Why should we bother about it? We need to tell our own stories. This is the most important thing. We need to tell our own stories. Every one of you sitting in this room with a mobile phone is a journalist. And if, you go, if you've seen me on Twitter or on Facebook, I do that day in and day out. I see a broken road. I saw something yesterday when I stepped out of the airport, just stepping out of the airport, that the Shabrimala booth inside the Cochin International Airport was vacant. At 8 in the morning, it's vacant. And hundreds of passengers are coming out, going near the booth and saying there's nobody sitting inside. I took a picture and posted it and it created a requisite havoc everywhere. It got circulated in a lot of Hyderabad based groups and all that. The idea is not to create panic. The idea is to create a subtle message saying, this is my soft power. This is what I'm using it. So please use your soft power that is there with you to influence decision. Not watching some stupid forwards on WhatsApp. It doesn't add any value in life. And as Commodore was saying in the morning and others were repeating, read, read, read and read. So create your own stories. Don't depend on other stories. That's what India is doing today. India is creating its own stories. We are creating our own success stories. And we are going and telling the entire world about be Modi ji or be it you or me. We are all talking about it. Our culture. These are our soft powers. Our cuisine. Our martial arts. Rajaman sir spoke about that. Our yoga. He did speak about that. Music. Movies he spoke about. Rajnikanth is more popular in Japan. You know, he makes more money in Japan than in India sometimes. Even movies that have been flop in India have gone on to become hits abroad. Very strange. Our arts, our diplomacy, everything is our soft power. The list can go on. I can produce 20 to 30 items like this. Let's look at a few examples. Our curry. In Britain, the most popular dish is butter chicken. The most popular dish in Britain for the last at least for a decade is butter chicken. Of course, there are many variations that have come to it right now. So much so the British restaurants which 
are eclectic and many of my friends since i am from a hotel management background many of them who work for decades they are saying sir even in a continental restaurant french restaurant they are coming and asking for butter chicken masala so that is our power of cuisine people come to india not to eat their food which they been eating at home when i come to kerala i don't like to eat what i was eating in hyderabad i would like to eat something here a puttu or a appam or anything even though, even though my house and my wife did does, does make that every week in here at home but the point is we need to market our cuisine and our cuisine is the biggest power that we have today there are indian restaurants everywhere i worked in bangkok and i can tell you that every street in bangkok has dozens of indian restaurants dozens of them why because we sold our soft power that way as at one time eating curry for a british man was like he would get a bombay belly next day or delhi belly as they call it but no longer people today have it everything they have they've realized that indian cuisine is so good so why is it that we also get thai cuisine we get french cuisine likewise let's sell indian cuisine to them also and that is our biggest one of the soft powers that we have please somebody indicate the time to me please i'm not looking at my watch yoga so spoke about it the international yoga day subtly without realizing we have created a huge impact across the world which is this location times square in us new york look at that crowd there what has yoga got i mean there have been people who have been telling that yoga is religious don't do it many other combination per saudi arabia does it what's your problem boss you don't understand our guys have a problem in india but abroad every country has adopted it yoga is a way of life it's it's a relaxation it is a it's it's a kind of getting your muscles in order getting your brain in order and as a breathing exercise conducted today morning what that was it this is what we need to realize that we are we are we have to be very good at marketing our thing music from zakir i mean ustad allah rakha to everybody el subramaniam everybody goes abroad and plays music el raja plays music in london philharmonic orchestra how come our music is accepted abroad that is what we need to we don't haven't realized this power within us we have this we need to market this and our music from centuries it has been there our sitars our unique thing our veena these are very very unique thing a violin you cannot really call it an indian instrument it is more come from abroad but look at the unique instrument we have created in india jal tarang these are things which we need to market abroad our music needs to go abroad surely enough because of the spread of internet because of social media a lot of music is now getting exchanged across platforms so you find that some person releasing a video in trivandrum gets watched in new york also or even in london that is the kind you don't know where your next audience is going to come from your soft power is music okay question quiz question now that's already there i don't know how many of you can read it but how many of you know the kantalur shala one person in the audience this i didn't know till couple of months back till sahana singh one of the india's leading media personalities who is now in the uh, uh, us she wrote to me uh, she sent me a message saying suresh do you know this place i said i don't know but you were in trivandrum as uh, janam tv ceo i said yeah i was but i didn't know this place existed so i sent one of my ex colleagues from janam leo radhakrishnan i said please go check this place out he went there and took this picture you know what this is this was one of the oldest universities what was called the nalanda of south today that place has no any traces of a university being there but this is the rich culture we are sitting on suppose i market this hundreds of people thousands of people foreign tourists will come it is not just the beach they are coming for it is not just the um, massages they are coming for no it's beyond that ayurveda beyond that there is a world our culture our history and this is what it is we don't need to go to the same place that's why when people come to hyderabad i said don't go to salajang museum don't go to uh, golconda fort don't go to charminar it's all seen but there are many other places which i can show you where history has been created there's a house where winston churchill stayed in hyderabad for one year i can show you that in secunderabad rather so these are things there are many other places within our history but that is the british history i really don't want to show that guy because he was he was an awful chap but i'm talking of our glorious history and this was a, a produced by i think opi jindal or some other private university uh, in up north this is next year's calendar with 12 such universities from nalanda to takshashila everyone we had this but how many of us in the audience are able to sell this this is what the government of india is doing now 
the picking up the cherry picking these places where people don't go don't rush to a taj mahal but go to the birdeshwara temple in tanjavur how many of you seen it what's so unique about it the huge stone the hundreds of tons whatever weight of the stone sits right on top of the temple which crane was used lnt or uh komatsu or what what was used nothing that was the technology the elora temple how many of you been there elora what is so unique about it it was chiseled from top to bottom a mountain was taken huge rock mountain was taken and the chiseling was done from top to bottom usually we build everything from bottom up imagine the the kind of work that is there in belur halibet shravana belagola you name it every there are hundreds and thousands of temples including ones in kerala the vadakunadan temple which is said to be the second biggest temple after angkor wat in terms of the sheer scale and size if you count the taking god maidanam around it but how many of us have gone and sold that thing that there is a line that can be drawn from there to rameshwaram or there can be a line that is drawn from there to varanasi a geographical line which goes straight how did how was it calculated nobody knows this is what i'm saying we have to market a soft power a soft power is our culture buddhism uh, this is our biggest export to the world i was in thailand for a year almost in bangkok and i can tell you that the way they revere buddhism is more than what we do in india even hinduism they pray such a with such dedication our guys just go to the temple look at inside and say okay you're perfect now god thank you very much i'm leaving but they sit there the meditation and there are many forms of buddhism we know that after buddha died i mean there was there were splits among the disciples they went different ways the mahayana went one way and the others went the other way there were fights between them but this is a biggest export and look the entire east is today a buddhist thing the king of thailand is called rama the entire lineage is called rama now it's rama the 11th rama the 10th and rama the 11th that is how it is but their old capital was called ayutthaya it's still there 100 kilometers from bangkok all in ruins right now but what is it called ayutthaya and we here are scared to call our place something called ayodhya here that is how heritage is all about we need to market it that is why modi ji goes around you know we have tourists from sri lanka now there's a direct flight from colombo to both gaya there are so many other places your ajanta elora is full of uh, the buddhist monuments even mumbai for that matter elephanta caves it's all there but have you marketed those are soft powers which we need to convince the nations that look we are this come to us and we will teach you what it is all about recently just a week ago i think this happened india is taking up the restoration of not just angkor wat temple but across hundreds of other temples in other countries why are we doing it we want to remind the world that at one time the indian kingdoms indian kings ruled all the way till there beyond cambodia and beyond vietnam we ruled we never went to war we just went there occupied it that's it we never killed anybody to that extent so the angkor wat which is a beautiful temple the 400 acres of the biggest temple complex in the world is going to be renovated by india that's the message we are sending out as a cultural icon we are the cultural icon who want to tell the world that this is our soft power this is a biggest success in the recent times and there were many videos which i want to play but because of paucity of time i'm not doing it but the vaccine diplomacy we the covid shield or we the covaxin we exported when our country itself was struggling at one time but there were priority there were african nation there were asian nation there were myanmar like in this picture was struggling or people are dying in thousands and we needed to save them especially in the phase one of it this is what our and today people nations remember us for that guyana remembers that a nation a line a kind of small small islands to whom we had given the vaccine remember us for helping them you will never forget a person who helped you when you are in trouble remember that and india was one such example where we went out of the way to do our vaccine diplomacy and ensure that people get vaccines what is this it's a bowl isn't it it is one of the gifts presented to by modi ji during the g20 conference in bali a month ago this is a stone called agat it a g a t e it's a very precious stone it's found in certain uh, formation chemical formations in the gujarat region it has been dug out but it's very malleable that means you can make something out of it and this stone was gifted and along with that a description was given not just about 16 to 17 items i'm not listing all of them here because the presentation will go on for the next one hour then 
16 to 17 gifts were given out. Today, when Indian diplomats, Indian Prime Minister, Indian President goes abroad, they don't take a Taj Mahal replica and give it, or a Qutub Minar replica. There are places, there are instances, there are gifts that can be given, be it from Pochampalli, or be it Bidri, or any of those places, or even unknown stuff being gifted. Why are we doing it? Because that cultural power that we bring to the table. Look, this is what we have. We are not just a land of elephants and snakes. If you think of, we are beyond it now. Rajaman sir, you, you spoke about the martial arts here. The monks from Kerala are said to have gone to Shaolin in China. How many of you know that? And the Shaolin monks came to India and learned Kalari Pite and went back and did their own version of it. Kung Fu, Karate, Taekwondo, everything we know. But have you marketed Kalari Pite in the real way? There are many people who come to learn, but there is no proper way to do it. Now, the government of Kerala, I imagine, starts a campaign across the world saying, come learn Kalari Pite in one year. You can't learn Kalari Pite in one year, but you can still at least get a basic knowledge of it, how to do it. Very dangerous sport because one wrong move and you can get cut into half. That's simple as that. So this is another aspect. And there are many martial arts like this across the country. I've just stated one example because I'm in Cochin today. That is why. It works the other way around also. This is the mayor of a Korean city, Gima, who presented a Bodhi tree sample to Modi ji. They are coming and telling us, you are our heritage. You gave us this. We are giving it back to you. Somebody had taken this small branch from here and planted it there in, in Korea, South Korea. Now the tree has grown big, so they have given a sample of it to him. Now, this is the difference. They are thanking you for saving their culture, for preserving their culture, for letting the Indian ethos go from here and spread it across the world. That is the most important thing. The G20 presidency, again, why G20? Why did we do it? Many people say, oh, it's a diplomatic thing. They all come, they sit, they dance, they whine, and then they all give speeches and go off. No, beyond it. If you observe the many monuments across the country last week or the week before that were illuminated with the G20 logo. There are many places which people haven't even known, historical places, not the usual culprits, the Taj Mahals and the Qutub Minars and the Humayun tombs and all. No. Beyond it, there are many other such places where these were put up. That rock in Mahabalipuram, many of you would know that. When the Chinese Prime Minister had gone, that Krishna's rock it's called. The butter rock. It still stands there without defying gravity. I don't know how. We, none of us know it. But these are examples of showing how we can popularize our cultural motifs, our traditional motifs, our arts, crafts, culture, and thereby create an impact. To close this presentation, I would just repeat this quote, which comes, it's, it's better to twist minds than to twist arms. You can threaten a person and you can twist his arms, but it's better to convince a person and let them change their mind. And that is what we are talking of the entire thing about soft power is all about. We need not beat up a guy black and blue, but if you can convince him that we can change it, that is the most wonderful thing you can do. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, the management of Amrita Institute of Business for giving me an opportunity to make a presentation. I don't know how much time I have for the Q&A, but if there are any questions, because uh, they say where I teach management students, there's one thing I again ask. When you finish a presentation and then there are no questions, there are two things to be assumed. One is the audience has understood everything, or second, the audience has understood nothing. So I hope that's the first one, not the second. Any questions, please? Yes, sir. Good question. Now, I can't watch for him, I can't speak for him. But, you know, imagine him coming to Shabarimala and what would happen to the rest of the pilgrims. As a, as a detail of the SPG, the the special protection group, the blue book of security, the entire area will have to be cleansed out completely. And you are, the temple is located bang in the middle of a forest, the Periyar Tiger Reserve. So, it's, I mean, it's up to him. Finally, he can decide to take a call on a non-Mandala Kalam season and he can come and do it. But that would be a good, good example, as you stated, rightly stated so, because I don't know many, how many of you know that the, the area around the Padmanabha Swami temple, when you were initially, about five, six years, we tried to walk, a lot of stones used to be there, small, small stones. If you've gone recently in the last two years, you would see that the entire area has been put with granite stones, very soft granite stones, not slippery ones. That project was part of a central government initiative to bring that temple to its glory. I mean, of course, it's the most richest temple in the world today. But still, to, to, I mean, he came to Padmanava Swami temple. People see it. See, what, that's what happens. 
when you have cultural like not just modi anybody for that matter it's a big film star comes everybody says oh somebody went there but it's that chap as you call in hindi it's a stamp saying this is this place is good you should go there and that was what cultural motive is all about that's a soft power good question sir but i can't answer for him his his call to take next i think the students from here should go there the three of them should take up a project to fire them and say let's go do some research before going there do the basic research i'm sure that does place doesn't exist do you know that next to the kudalmanikam kshetram the, there is a small uh, shed very run down house where adi shankaracharya had set up a mat like the, you have the brahmasam madam in trishur something very similar but very small in nature it's totally run down you will look at and you will not even realize that that as it is a, it is a veda patashala that was there it's still there but i don't know how many students come there this is history this is cultural motives what is so unique about kudal manikam how many of you in this room can relate to what's very unique it's only possibly the only temple in india which has that not the land holding which i spoke about what is so unique that's correct which are the other deities in this temple none the deity is so powerful that they tried installing lord ganesha it broke into two the idol they tried many other things they tried putting tulsi plant inside the temple it refused to grow there's some power i mean i am not a guy who believes in all the mumbo jumbo but i believe that there's a certain power that happens why no explanation you can't explain uh, such things to the mankind but there is something but this is where your research comes up all about an mba can be a project on how to revive the cultural icons and bring more business to kerala or for that matter any other part of the country this is what we need to do any more questions so yeah uh, as this court says this is this is this uh, what happened in the gujarat elections because uh, most of the medias were praising about the uh, gujarat model of development and all those things but no media actually covered the, the real issues facing in gujarat like Uh, li- uh, like zero point five percent of the GDP only they are spending in the uh, education sector, and less than one percent of their G- GDP only they are spending on the healthcare sector. So why did they ask questions? You are asking why didn't they ask? Good no, question. Sir. No yeah. sir, like uh, does media uh, like conveying what the powerful people want us to know, or like are they using media to cover up the things that media they are- media will show what the viewers want to see. Yeah. Arnab Goswami does his show because he has an audience. tomorrow arnab goswami says i will not shout or scream i been on his debate and i can tell you that screaming and shouting is a part of getting that audience to watch you your question is good but sir the media are actually supposed to show what's really happening right it doesn't but work that way i wish that was no the no country including united states the so called free speech works so Me- in the russia ukraine issue also there might be some reasons why russia is no that reason is very obvious that reason is very obvious The Russians are a villains in every way. They stopped the SWIFT system of international transfer. How many of you know about SWIFT system here? Business management graduates. S W I F T. Yeah, there's one hand right at the back. Two, three. Learn about it. So is it because the Ukraine going behind that uh, European Union membership? Yeah, that is it. Because there's Poland. Russia wants a border which has a non-NATO state, so they took over two regions along the Russian border. Now that is with them. So that as long as they control that, they are very clear that. they are safe imagine pakistan trying to occupy some regions of india to build a border around it we will not allow it that's exactly what is happening in ukraine very very simple example but it's it's far more complex because of the disintegration of soviet union any more questions please okay okay yeah i think that make last question because i think after this people want to leave so i don't want to detain anybody sir when uh, europeans came to india uh, british or any other forces uh, what they wanted was trade so we can think of it as soft power so initially what they wanted was trade but they ended up uh, trolling us and uh, now we have globalization again it's trade so does soft power convert to hard power come again please does soft power convert mm-hmm. to hard power to a situation where uh someone is having a more advantage over other countries yeah. yeah thank you good question yes sometimes you know you can tell a person once twice thrice and finally you see in the best way of disciplining a indian child is what the mother does one slap and fight 
even a teacher used to do that in school but now if you do it you go to jail now that's a problem but that's what works sometimes you're right about it the the part of the international diplomacy is all about threatening them through words first and if they don't listen to you do a bala court simple as that and that's what what is the first part of your question i forgot i just i only remember the second part of it you did ask about something to start with and then i missed that first part you said something about sir i was saying about uh, the colonization first yeah yeah now that's a good question colonization which was the biggest naval battle ever fought in the history not on the front row because last night we discussed during the dinner which was the biggest naval battle ever fought in the history now don't count now don't say us uses kitty hawk or uh, franklin d roosevelt aircraft carriers no i'm talking because uh, go back to history which is the biggest naval battle and this you will find in all military books not in our history books okay since nobody's answer i'll give one of the front rows a chance no no they will answer it i think they all know it anyway i'll tell you that yes sir marthanda varma fought the biggest naval battle the battle of kolachal how many of you have gone to kolachal that is the place you have the a huge obelisk there where the indian army every year on the day when the dutch surrendered the dutch were also called the dutch, dutch east india company the colonization of dutch east india company stopped because of the defeat by marthanda varma he it was it was a ferocious battle and the dutch had the biggest naval power in the world at that time not even the british british are nowhere near it is because of destruction of that entire dutch fleet the dutch lost its entire power now when you talk of colonization and link it to globalization what is wrong with globalization tell me we are trying to sell our products abroad china tried to sell its candles in india and lights fairy tale lights in india and everything that works for 6 months was sold in india but there's nothing wrong in globalization you you all living in a today countries students get exchange programs isn't it you go study university abroad for 6 months and you take all your credits there what is that about that's globalization again we are one we are not an island anymore we are not north korea we are not iran please remember that we are not afghanistan we are a part of a human civilization and naturally we will sink or rise with the rest of the world but we need to protect ourselves so if the international price of crude go up we will buy from russia or any devil for that matter thank you very much and uh, once again i thank everyone for giving me this opportunity and especially the management of amrita institute of business planning thank you sir is a personality who believes in standing up for a good cause no matter what the consequences are and we hope sir that you continue working for such causes that would make a huge and everlasting impact on our society we thank you sir for your stimulating speech I request Dr. Reji Kumar to hand over the memento to Mr. Suresh Kochattar as a token of our love and appreciation. Thank you very much.